Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Name to Be Inserted podcast. <laughs> and when I say that, I don't mean it's a literal name. I think it's just going to be a name that we haven't quite figured out yet, because I believe this will most likely be the second episode, depending on how myself or Calvin want to order it. So once again, my name is Zach. I'm Calvin. All right. And welcome back to the podcast. So I think last episode, we talked a little bit about school. So I think this is going to be a good way to segue into, into this next topic, engineering school. So in case you didn't, everyone didn't pick up, we are both, I mean, by... The government of Ontario standards, we cannot legally call ourselves engineers until we get our PNG in the I province. I am an engineer in training by like legal title. Me too. We are both engineers in training with intent that I think I'm going to get my PNG probably next year. I think that's when I'm going to try and get my I am a, I'm in the final workings to get my full licensure. So in maybe a couple of well, months, I should be able to call yeah. myself an official Because you, you, you wrote the exam, right? You wrote the ethics exam already? Yeah, yeah. I went through the... Okay, we'll, we'll talk about the process in a sec. But I, I went through the entire process for the most part. I just got to finalize some paperwork. Okay, okay. But I still need to... There, and to give everyone an idea, in Ontario, there's... Uh, also, for I guess in general, um, engineering is very based on where you're located. And not by just a country, but also by a state or province uh, for any of the U.S. people out there. So if I have a engineering license in Ontario, for example, doesn't mean I can easily transfer it over to Alberta or to uh, North Carolina or Wisconsin because those different areas will have different regulations of what is needed for and different um, concepts of training that is needed. So to, if I, I yes, I got my PNG in Ontario and maybe it'll transfer over to some places, but sometimes it'll say like, okay, you need, we need to double check some other stuff as well. Yeah. So the so for context, right? Um, because people don't actually like realize this, but engineering is actually a professional program, and it's actually professionally regulated. So it's in the same like ballpark as your, you know, your lawyers, your doctors, your dentists, and stuff. Exactly. If you do lawyering in Ontario, <laughs> lawyering, <laughs> lawyering. <yes, excellent. laughs> if you are practicing law in Ontario, doesn't mean you can go and practice law in Nova Scotia for whatever reason, because they have very different laws and re- and regulations. For example, and this is what every uh, 16 year old in Ontario will ever tell you is that in Ontario, I think the legal age of drinking is 18, if I remember correctly. 18 or 19? 19. 19. In Quebec, I think it's 6, 7? 18, I believe. It's actually. 18, is it? Yeah. It's 17 in Alberta, I believe. Really? I, th- I didn't think Alberta was actually lower Alberta than Quebec. Alberta was the lowest one in the country, I from thought, what I remember. I always thought Quebec was the lowest one because they're uh, more French, so, and usually Europeans are a little bit more relaxed <laughs> oh, yeah. about it. Um, so. So because of stuff like that, it's like, okay, well, that has very different um, ideologies and uh, the law is based differently around in those in those uh, provinces and states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So going back, right, so the way professional things are, like, designated is that you must have a, a license in order to practice, right? Yep. Just like how if you finish medical school, you have to finish your residency and all that stuff before you're allowed to actually practice medicine yeah right so in the same vein in canada at least like or at least the system that like we're going through is uh you you finish your engineering school and then you get what is hopefully what is called an accredited degree right Mm -hmm. which means that the government has gone through like the university's program the course curriculum and everything and have said okay this uh, this program will teach you uh everything that you should need to know to be a practicing engineer and once you have that degree you still have to go through like the license process. So yeah. again, just like how there's a residency, it's a similar process here. Exactly. So there's um, so that's the one way you can go through, and that's where a lot of people who go take the university path go through is they want to try to go through an accredited university. For people who don't, there you can still get your PNs without a without a university degree. They, they just add on an extra test. The uh, this is now a technical exam. So usually, you would to get a PNG in Ontario, um, you have to get a you have to take two tests. You have to take a technical. And you have to take a uh, ethics exam as well. The ethics, ethics exam, everyone has to take, even if you come out of university. It's, it's called the professional practice, right? It's yeah. just so that you're aware of, well, the profession and all the things that you are responsible for. Exactly. And that includes things like if I go work for company A, who's working on industry X, and then I go try and, and I want to do some side consult consultation for company B that's also working in industry X, is that a violation of the Code of Ethics in Ontario? And that's the main thing. And there's stuff like that, and it goes into a bunch of different topics. I think, like, the, I didn't take the test yet. I think the test is, like, what, like, 100? It's now, like, it's all multiple choice now, right? Oh, but, yeah, they changed the system because of the pandemic a little bit. But, I mean, the core concepts is the same, right? It's, it's a test that you take so that you are aware or you're, 
they're, they are they are aware that you are aware yeah. of all the things that you need to know about ethical practice, the things that you are responsible for, why the decisions that you make are so important. And all mm-hmm, that exactly. Stuff. And in the previous written form, it also it, they used to hand you the code of ethics, a copy of it in the exam, and then you would go and sit in like a classroom setting, and you just write out, and the questions would be maybe like five or six, and you have to and be different scenarios. And I believe from what I've heard from other people, they say that what they're always looking for is they're looking for how, what is the scenario? How does that scenario apply to this code of ethics? Are they breaking or not? And can you give other codes? And you got to list all the different codes of ethics that apply to this situation and why they are violating or why it's not violating it. And then you got to give the exact cite citations of it. That's essentially what you're looking for. Yeah, but, but because of the pandemic, sorry, sorry to cut you off. Um, uh-huh. Because of the pandemic, um, a lot of other provinces used to just always have a multiple choice system. I believe it was actually just Alberta, but I could be wrong. Ah, so okay, so <laughs> maybe so. I know one other province had a had a multiple choice system, and because of the pandemic, and they couldn't do in person tests anymore, they say, "Well, screw it, let's just make everything multiple choice again." And, and you know what? That is actually what most um, tests are. Um, so my girlfriend Kay, she is a nurse. She had to take a similar test for professional for her professional license, and. Hers was once again, uh, I think it was like 300 multiple choice questions. It was crazy. And I was just like, and I think hers is also all online as well. So similar how you take your driving test. I think if you got one wrong, they either tell you immediately or maybe they just skip it. I can't remember. I, I don't know which one you prefer. Do you prefer to know right away whether you got the answer wrong on a multiple choice but, and then you can't change it? Or do you want to have the um, ability to not know and go back and change it? Oh boy, uh, that's like the test taking meta. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, personally for me, I I think I would prefer not to know, just so I don't get it in my head too much, and I don't try to like make unnecessary connections. Because man, this goes back to like the chemistry days, where like in the chemistry exams, uh, the multiple choice portions for that, where if you think you got one question right, but like this conflicts with the other question, so like mm-hmm. I might get both of these right or both of these wrong. Exactly, and sometimes like you know, I, I know teachers always used to say that, uh, oh, if you don't know the answer, skip it, go to the next one, and then figure out, and then maybe you'll give you a hint for the question back there. I just been a couple times it's been like that. So my take on it is that if I have the ability to go back and change my answer, then I'm okay with that one. But if I am always locked in no matter what, then I'd rather just know right away whether I got it right or wrong. That's true. That's fair. Because that, that's those are two different ways. If it's somewhere in between, then I always just prefer the previous one, which is just the uh, tell me if I'm right or wrong by that point. So anyways, so that's a little bit about the Ontario engineering ethics, uh, how we get your PNG in Ontario specifically, if, anyone, if any soon-to-be EITs and engineers are interested. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about our programs a little bit. So I think in our first episode, we talked about how I was a chemical engineer. Specifically, I took a uh, program called chemical engineering and management which basically is a adds an extra year onto it so to give some other context my degree was a four-year degree by uh by base format and then because i took the management side i added on an extra year and because of co-op which is basically just a i took a job for a year in an engineering firm i added on in one more year so that was a total of six years of a what was supposed to be a if i took the base one a four-year program because all my add-ons calvin what about you man So I'm an electrical engineer by trade, kind of. Like, it's a long story, man. All right, story time. Not by trade yet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah, well, yes and no, right? So here's the thing. So I I did my undergrad uh, in electrical engineering. Well, kind of electrical engineering. So I had a almost like a double major program. So I I took electrical engineering, but I also took biomedical engineering. Uh, It was all crammed in a four-year program, though. So that was a lot, a lot of work. Uh, and then after that, I actually continued on to grad school, unlike unlike Zach. So I, I got my master's degree a little bit after that, and I'm currently suffering uh, in a PhD. Well, here, let's go all the way back to first year Calvin, because the first year Calvin, I remember, was not an engineer. Oh, yeah. You were a life science major. I was going to say some other kind word, but I'm not going to say it here. <laughs> um, so you were a life science major, because you, if I remember correctly, and you can, you'll correct me in, if I'm wrong in a second, is that... You went to life science, said, this shit's easy. I'm going to go into something hard. And now you say, you say that in grad school, you regret it. But let's see if, uh, but I think that maybe that'll change in a couple of years or more. So let's elaborate on that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh yeah. So I mentioned like previous, um, maybe it was on mic, maybe it wasn't. But uh, at one point, you know, everyone who wants to like go into like life sciences, medical sciences or whatever, I mean, they'll, they'll apply to med school. Why not? Right. 
Um, so just like with anyone who was like 16, 17, like, and applying to university and all of that, like, I didn't know what I wanted to do. There's like three jobs that I know in my head, like an engineer, because some of my friends wanted to be an engineer, doctors, lawyers, right? Teachers, because there's teachers in the classroom. And like, I, I don't know what kind of like jobs there are. And of them, you know, I, I had a little bit of encouragement from like my biology teacher and all that, that, you know, you're, you're, you're pretty good at the sciences. Why, why, don't, you, why don't you try to go for med school? It's like, well, that's one of the four jobs I know. So sure, why not? So I applied to a couple of different schools uh, for uh, their life science or biomedical sciences programs. And I also applied to a couple of engineering schools because, you know, that's what my friends were doing. And that's, that's what you do in high school. You follow the crowd, right? Uh, and I didn't actually get accepted by any of the engineering schools. Not a single one. Of them. Um, Crazy. You're all dumb because of it. <laughs> yeah. Instead, uh, I... I Got us to quite a few of like the life sciences and medical sciences programs because, well, those just accept a ton of people. So it's a lot easier to get it. And to give everyone another little bit of context, that's usually the, if you're wanting to be an engineer, that's the safe schools. That's the safe program. So yes, continue on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I, I got to, so I got into the program and I was like, you know, going through everything and, you know, still med school mentality. And I'm like giving myself depression trying to like work through everything because there is this toxic like mindset that does get like spread around a lot in like early med school like applicants or like people who are in their first or second year uh, that just like don't really know what's going on um, that every single grade point every single mark that you did not get 100 other people did and so now you are a hundred steps behind your application because believe it or not um, the way it works in Ontario is when you apply for medical school, the application process is harder than almost anything on the planet. Honestly, a lot of the times and a lot of the people that I've talked to when it comes to like admissions, it sometimes comes down to the roll of the dice. Uh, wh whoever just like gets in, gets in. Right? And so I was in that like toxic mindset and giving myself depression. Jeez. <laughs> I mean, I've never had that mentality when I was signing up for it. And maybe that's because I'm more of a, I didn't, I never took biology. I never really liked biology in that sense. Um, I was always more of a math science guy that I enjoyed a lot more, but then with uh, biology, it just never really clicked in for me. I never, I never really like liked it that much. And also it just really just felt like a lot of memorization. And then maybe by the med school part of it, maybe you start applying it for more, but it always sounds like, unless you're doing research, it's always, if it's these symptoms, it could be this, this, and this, and you're just testing it and you're trying to remember what everything is. So right. I know this episode is supposed to be on engineering school, but I'm going to take a further tangent to talk about like the med practice have, of medicine. This is like, we're only like a couple minutes in, man. We're, we're fine. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the thing is, right, like I, I have talked to, again, a bunch of like people who have gone through the medical school system and they, some of them regret it because they don't tell you this when you're young and, you know, everyone's like looking up to like the four jobs they know. Uh, you know, there's so much prestige and stuff connected to medicine and all that because, you know, that's, that's just what all the shows and stuff do as well. You know, this like rich doctor or whatever. But in practice, a lot of the times it will feel like a license to do human experimentation because you actually don't fully know what's going on. There's just so much stuff that like changes from person to person. So it is kind of like you said, where it's like they have some symptoms. I think it could be this. But at the same time, you don't know. You're just taking an educated guess. And then seeing what happens and then continuing that process until they're hopefully better. So I'm going to apply a, 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 a show reference to that because I was, I, I never watched House MD. I mean, you know the show, right? Yeah, um, so I watched a clip of it um, recently and uh, my girlfriend Kay, she was you like, you watch House? And I'm like, no, I just watched like a clip. So he's, it's because he's a funny guy, right? So there was a episode. I forget what the, I don't know what the episode was called, but it was basically like a helicopter mom was trying to control the son's treatment and telling the doctors that they were wrong and that she wanted an opinion from the CDC, which is the uh, Center for Disease Control in the U.S., right? Because it's a U.S.-based show, right? I don't know what the Canadian version of it is, of the CDC. But either way, um, she wants a second opinion from them, but she just sends records over to the CDC. So then I think at some point the show, the person comes back and they kind of fake the phone call, essentially. What they basically say is, but the, apparently it's common practice is that just because you send records over doesn't mean squat until you meet the patient. Like, you can say on paper from the nurse 
from the doctor who was examining the patient at the time what their symptoms were. But until the doctor actually, another, another doctor actually comes in that's supposed to be authorizing this treatment, examines the patient, and then gives their thoughts after the fact, then it, it's basically meaning charts or symptoms on the sheet sheet can be meaningless until you actually physically see the person. Because there's so many different things that can be examined that are not seen initially on either a report or are not seen by the first doctor first inspecting potentially, right? Yeah, yeah. Like that, it's a scary thing where it's, you know, we, we call it biological variants where, yeah, like everyone who presents, everyone who kind of comes in, you know, just, just by virtue of everyone being, you know, your unique little snowflake, you're, you're different. And so a lot of medicine is actually based on statistical likelihood, which, I mean, maybe I'm scaring people and they won't want to go to their doctor anymore, but that's kind of how yeah. it is. No, everything's statistically likely. Like, <laughs> it's statistically likely that when I drive out of here today, um, that I'm going to be fine. But, there's, but that's statistically likely. It's not for certain. <laughs> like, I can get into an accident or whatever. Like if, you know, it's statistically likely that the floor that I'm standing on is not going to break. Likely, not guaranteed. <laughs> like, ne- ne- if someone tells you that something is 100% guaranteed, then they're quote unquote lying. Like, you, obviously, if I say, if I know that the spoon that I'm about to use is going to pick up the soup, yes, that you're pretty much almost always going to be guaranteed it, right? But it's always going to be some likelihood that's not going to fail. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so uh, maybe this is like how, how I roll back, but statistics is actually one of the most important things that you can actually learn in like a science or like applied science setting. But regardless, you know, going back to my little story of, you know, I'm depressed trying to get into medical school, um, I, I decided it wasn't for me. I was, like, too sad about it all, right? Well, m- maybe not necessarily, like, too sad to, like, give up entirely, but I wanted to have a little bit of a safety net. Um, I, I, I didn't want to go through this, like, science program, not get into medical school, because, again, roll the dice, and I'm not exactly the luckiest person. Uh, and so I, I went through this big process of trying to transfer programs. Um, the unfortunate part, and this was what was told to me, you know, hearsay and all that, maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but uh, around the time that we were going through our, like, engineering school and, and the beginning of it, um, most schools in the country, uh, for whatever reason that year, uh, and the following years after, people started just, like, applying en masse. Like, engineering was, like, the new med school, where just everyone was applying for whatever reason. And so it became incredibly difficult and a lot of programs got really packed. And so it was difficult logistically to try to go through this transfer. Yeah, I think um, when I first applied in my heyday, <laughs> um, the average to get in was like an 80 to 85. I think now it's gone up like, like what, 95 or something? It 90? is easily over 95 now. Yeah, for it's most crazy. To... And then on top of that, when I first applied, I didn't have to do a full written application. I think I had to do like a little blurb every once in a while to like depend on which school I was applying to. But now they acquire, it's, it, as you said, equivalent to like a med school application where they acquire activities and such. And I don't know what, I, yeah, I don't know. I think whether or not, I don't know if engineers have become more popular. Maybe some people realize that engineering is a very much more, can be a lucrative field for the amount of work that you relatively do depending on which company you go in towards. Maybe, maybe. Because um, maybe we'll talk about it later, but you know, in my company specifically, so I just to give it a, I'm not going to say the company name, but maybe later on I'll, I'll talk about it. But um, I work for a wastewater company. We make um, membrane filtrations for uh, wastewater plants, usually municipal and industrial. And we talk every once in a while about how do we create pre-engineered package solutions, where all I need to do is click on three or four different inputs, and my package is already made because it's already been pre-engineered. And sometimes that's what the engineer's job is. Like when you say, "Oh, I'm going to create the engineering package," quote so to speak, it really is just a uh, taking very general guidelines for the industry and just applying it across multiple spaces. And that's all that is. And then you get paid a lot of money for it sometimes. And the nice part about what I do is that my company is a little bit smaller. So I get to apply a lot of those engineering principles right off the bat. Um, and I have to create those standards rather than um, taking a very laid out strict template that a lot of big companies have Instead of that, it's like, no, I have a general template and I have to modify it the way it is. And that's where a lot of learning, learning happens, at least for me specifically. But um, yeah, I don't know why, why engineer has like, why they all, there's also a big intake. Because I didn't really know, and just to give you my personal preference is that, or my personal experience is that um, when I first started looking up careers, so funny enough, in the last episode, you talked about, hey, Zach, you should have gone to law. Guess what? I was thinking about that. My uh, first job that I was ever going to get into was a, to be a cop. And then um, I 
then I moved on saying, like, well, I don't, want, I don't know if I want to be a street cop. Like, I kind of, I think I'm a little bit more talented for something else. Let me talk about detective work or maybe something mathematical. So I think it was like a bomb squad, something like that. And that's when I found out about, um, that's when I started hearing more and more about this term called an engineer. I was like, what is that? And it's like, and apparently this is like, you know, just broad thing, broad topic, right? So I, there was, I don't know if you had it, but there was a program where if you put in all your courses that you like, and all the courses that you want to take later on, it would spit out a bunch of different jobs that you could potentially be interested in, in terms of like best suited for you, second best suited, so on and so forth. Did you ever have something like that? Yes and no. Like I remember doing one of those things, but because like everything that I put in was just like all over the place, they were like, what, what, what do you actually want to do? Though? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Right. So I had something like that and something came up. It said like chemical engineer. And I was like, oh, I don't know what that is. I looked a little bit into it. And I was, and I was somewhat interested and it was one of the, it was at the same time where I took, so in grade 11, I took law. Um, funny I enough. did too. Yeah, I know. It was okay. I remember, um, the favorite part about that course was that me and my partner, we had to do, so at some point we had to do basically a quote unquote argument on both sides for the topic. And there was one side that it was, you pick a topic and one person had to be the devil's advocate and one person had to be the one who pushed it forward right mine was gun control oh and, boy yeah exactly that was a fun one and if you don't know what gun control is like in canada i don't either because i don't own one and every time i talk to someone who owns one it's a nightmare <laughs> to own one like it's it, us i know is pretty good on it it's pretty relaxed about it which is why you get a lot more they, they have it out. in their constitution they have a right to bear arms exactly here we do not it can easily be taken from us but that's a whole topic for another day so anyway so ours is gun control and i think my partner I, and I said to him, you know, I, I think I looked at him, I was like, you know what? I'm going to be devil's advocate. I'm going to push for gun control. I'm going to push for less gun control, which sounds like a stupid idea to some, to some Canadian standard. Or maybe it sounds better for some American standards, but I'm like, you know what? I'm going to do it. And I came from the standpoint of, it's not about controlling guns. It's about controlling, it's about uh, better screening the people who own them. Okay. And that was the idea where it's like, you know, if a lot of people who own guns, especially in Canada... You know, to, give, to give you an idea of what Canada is like for controlling, and, and someone else can tell me if I'm wrong or not, is that you're not allowed to have a gun loaded at any point in any case. In fact, I think the way it works now, I heard this from a YouTuber, YouTuber called Abin Preacher, basically Quebec, shout out to them, they're really cool YouTubers, you should go check them out, um, is that to own a gun, you need to have two separate lock boxes, one for the gun and one for the ammunition. So if anything happens, um, in your house, or let's say you want to go hunting, you need to take the gun out of the lockbox, arm it, whatever, put the put the lock, put the trigger pin in, it, whatever the case, whatever it is, and then you need to go to a second lockbox somewhere else in the house. I don't know how far it has to be. I don't know what the exact relations are, and that's where you get the ammo and grab it. So people say, well, if you're using it for hunting, it's not a big deal because you just transport it all in. You can just transport it all in one. But the, some people brought up the whole issue of like, you know, if you're being attacked in your home, it's like how do you quickly defend yourself, right? So. So to go back to everything, I'm going to not go on that tangent, but basically I took law and I wanted to be a cop. And then I realized I didn't like English <laughs> as much. I didn't oh, want to do yeah. the writing as much. And I realized like, you know, I'm good at math. Let me find something in the math field. So I actually was thinking about being a bomb squad guy. Um, back and, in a different life. <laughs> exactly. You know? um, and then I just settled back on chemical engineering. And, I, and my whole thought was like, yeah, I'm going to do chemical engineering and I'll see what opportunities come up. And my pathway just went towards wastewater and i like and i still i like it i very much like my like my uh job like my industry and such um and i think it's a very lucrative it's a very unknown field right we all know what goes down our toilets we all know that it somehow ends up in the river in one way or another what everyone doesn't know is how much work it takes to actually to get to that point and how big the job market is for some places like that um well, it's not like a basic necessity for like it is it, pocket it, cities. It is like that's what I'm saying. So we both do municipal and industrial applications. So um, where we can do a for a municipal application for like a city, a wastewater treatment plant for a city uh, to treat whatever incoming waste is coming from sewers or from other industrial areas if they have such things, or you do it strictly for industrial ones. So um, I, I'll give an example of a cheese manufacturing plant. How much off product is there that has to be treated and sent back into either the river? Or whatever um, water basin you have in the area. <laughs> so it's very unheard of and no one really likes it. I mean, it's the same thing as like, um, if, you know, saying like, why would you ever be a nurse if you had to deal with all the blood and stuff all the time? Well, some people are used to it. So it's like, some people look at poop 
and look at like you know the brown stuff on the ground and be like ew i'm like well it's not a big deal because if i'm as long as i'm protected it's not not an issue so i started to go back i started to go off that so i think you were talking about the med school stuff right Oh yeah, yeah. So, uh, oh my God, we're we're just we're circling all the way back now. Yeah. We've gone through like two different different like <laughs> careers at this point. But that's the point. <laughs> basically, um, big hoops of trying to transfer. Um, I was told that like they maybe let like a handful of people at best off programs just because like logistically it just, they just couldn't, right? And, and so uh, I, I hopped over. Um, I, I transferred into engineering, and. Uh, the way that the engineering school that I went to worked was you had a general engineering education in your first year, and then you chose a specialization afterwards, right? Uh, the idea was, you know, as Zach said, there's such a broad thing to engineering. You should get a taste of everything to kind of give you a feel for what you might actually want to do. And so uh, I, I, to this day, don't know uh, what actually went down, but I ended up in electrical engineering and uh I'm now like transitioning here and there to like different things. Yeah. And to give you, so I give some more people some more insight. Um, not all universities do that. Um, I think only a few universities actually specialize right in your first year, which I think is a bit of a mistake. I think like if maybe some people like that, some people know exactly what they want to do right away. But how many times have we seen people go from their first year and after the first year, be like, I don't know if I want to actually do what I wanted to do when I first came into this program. I had that, I had that mindset for a little bit. Um, after I took a programming course for the first time in my life in first year, I was like, one, I was good at it. And two, I was like, you know what? Maybe I do want to do this. So funny enough, um, in my university, they, um, they give you an option of when you go out of first year into your second year, um, your best 10 choices of what you want to do. And the idea is exactly what it sounds like where if you have high marks, you're basically always going to mostly give them your first choice, but it's also based on the popularity of the program at the time. And funny enough, I, I think my first choices were like the chemical engineering programs, and my second choices were computer, computer engineering, like software engineering and such. It was the most um, different take or different uh, span of courses that I, that I guess I could have taken. Because if I went from chemical to mechanical, it, there's a lot of overlap. If I go from chemical to materials, a lot of overlap, or civil as well. I went from chemical, I was like saying like, okay, if I'm not okay, if I'm okay with, if I'm not getting chemical, I'm going to go to computer. <laughs> That's like such a huge leap over some, to some extent. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, so I've actually, you know, being in grad school, you know, I, I, I can be the one standing in front of like a, a young impressional class of engineers and tutorial and talking about uh, just stuff. Right. And I've been asked a lot actually about, you know, what's the program that I want to get into if. I want to do X, Y, or Z, right? And honestly, the the answer is any of them because especially if you have that generalized first year, you got to get at least a feel for some things, right? And then you can kind of like have a conversation and pivot yourself afterwards. So you just kind of pick whatever is interesting to you at the time and you kind of roll with it. Now, having said that, um, it is a little bit easier to pivot from some programs to another, which is kind of what Zach's talking about where like computer engineering and chemical engineering are pretty far apart. Um, I don't know. Let's get your opinion on this too. So, like, I I think there are like three like broad categories. One where it's like, kind of like the like the physical sciences, I guess. So it's like your like mechanicals, your chemicals, um, materials, metallurgicals. You know that kind of like area. Civils, I guess you could throw in that area, right? P uh, transitioning from one to the next, pivoting around those fields is a little bit easier. Um, next is like your tech stuff, which is, you know, your software engineering, your computer engineering, your electrical engineering. Mechatronics. Yeah. Right. Uh, that, yeah, we, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And so that, that kind of is its own field as well, where it's like, again, it's slightly easier to pivot between those. And that's kind of what I'm doing right now, where like, I, you know, I, I took an electrical engineering undergraduate degree, but I'm working more in software now. So, you know, you can kind of like pivot around there. And the last one I consider is like your highly specialized one. So those are like your nano engineering, your like nuclear engineering. Like those are like very specialized and those are a little bit harder to pivot in general. But having said that, because they are highly specialized, you do get a lot of like really, really interesting skills. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Sorry. Went for a burp. End up in a cough. Um, yeah, I think I, I know engineering physics kind of like is a general base for a lot of those highly specialized ones. I think, you, I think anyone who wants to go into nuclear should always go into like engineering physics, my understanding of it. and. Yeah, I don't know. Like, um, you can get, a, I guess, to some degree, every 
course will have its own popularity and will always have its own need for it. Um, I think you told me the story about how um, after you went to, so you did a instructional assistant internship at yeah. at your university school. Yeah. And the person you took after you was terrible. And I think you told me that, that you heard from one of the TAs or one from the students, if I remember correctly, that they were dunking on civil engineering and chemical engineering saying there's no jobs out there it's only in tech oh my god and i'm gonna and i would look to him and say you're an idiot all right because how do you want to build the building how do you want to make the wastewater plant how do you want this uh nuclear reactor to be correctly built so that way it contains all your energy in that case how um what sort of foundation do you need for the for the um computer server area that you want to build in like there's all these different things that some people are just completely blind to um and that's why i think whenever i hear people saying like oh all the work's in tech like no all the big money is in tech it's a bubble yeah it's a separate tech bubble that you do but you still need the people to do the work you still need the engineers you still need in the engineering thought process and a lot of these other civil works and such like like people just think like, oh, buildings just get built out of nowhere. It's like, no, people actually spend a lot of time and effort into it. Snap and, your fingers, it shows up. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Than, just Thanos it back into existence, right? Um, you just end up with these um, people who have no idea of what it is. And I think it's just like, as you said, it's, it's a bubble. It's You're only living in that one field and that's it. So when I heard about that, and he's telling this to a bunch of first year students. Now, yes, these are like what? I think you're 18 or 17 at the time. They're, they're about 18. Yeah, around 18 at the time. That's still somewhat impressionable. Like. It's still, yeah, it's still some, even though in Canada we're a little more relaxed about it, how in the US it's like 21 and then here it's like 8, 19 to drink. Like, it's still somewhat impressionable to uh, tell a bunch of first years who, A, are coming out of high school first time and dealing with the stress of a university or college lifestyle, and then B, are being told all these different ideas of like, they came in thinking they were going to be mechanical and now they don't know. And now you're telling them that mechanical sucks or you're telling them that civil sucks. It's like, that's just disingenuous to that field because just because you don't work in that field, just because you have this idea that all the tech is going in one way or because you read this article from Zuckerberg or Elon saying AI is the next generation of workers of things and that. It's like, no, you're being completely um, critical thinking. Exactly. That critical (laughs) thinking that we always talk about is just, you know, put a little more thought into it. And it's just, when I heard that, I was just like, man, that guy, I'm glad. I think you, I think they ended up firing him, right? Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, his contract finished and they just kind of like... Let, let, let it be. Yeah. But I think but they changed a lot of the course after that guy. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the specifics. But um, the, the thing is, I was pretty fortunate in that like I lived with a bunch of other like engineers and different... Oh, I guess engineering students, you know, legally <laughs> uh, throughout yeah. uh, the, my, my years in my undergrad, right? And so... I, I had a little bit of like the other perspectives in the different fields, right? So I, I stayed with some people who were like really into like nuclear physics and like nuclear engineering. I stayed with some people who are really into like optical engineering and optic science. Uh, I stayed with someone who was uh, in civil engineering. So, you know, he wanted to like build a concert hall, right? And so I'm like, that's really cool. So I got a little bit of like, you know, just conversation with everyone. And to be honest, I think that out of a lot of our like final year like projects, uh, which is something we'll talk more about in a sec, but final year projects are, are, are like, you know, the culmination of what, you, of what your degree is supposed to be. And I talked to my friend, that, that civil engineer who literally designed a concert hall, right, from the ground up, from everything. And I thought that was really, really cool. Mm-hmm. But it's not like they can't just do it themselves. Like they need, well, I guess there is, I know there is something called a sound engineer, right? Or, um... I guess because you, you need a combination of both civil, sound, electrical, and you probably need some form of mechanical for some structural stuff, right? And I see that every day as well with my wastewater. Like people think like, oh, okay, wastewater is just like chemical or whatever. It's like, no, I deal with electrical. I deal with mechanical. I even deal with um, biological engineers as well, where it's like more on the bio side on everything. And it's just a whole mix. It just really depends on the industry. And like, if you're only working in tech, then yes, all you're going to be working with is electrical, maybe some phys- en- engineering, phys- physics engineers. And... um I can't think of a third thing at the, at the top of my head, but it's always going to be a mix. And I ran into the situation with a lot of people, especially in a workplace environment, is that pe- a lot of people like to stay in their lane. <laughs> yeah, and, they do. They really do. I know. They, like, they only want to do one thing and one thing well, which is fine. But if you're going to be a very highly skilled engineer, a highly, you know, whether you're going to be managing people or managing a team of people, you have to have the expertise from all around the, 
all around the different bases. Um, Cause then you just don't know. Cause then you don't know if someone's doing something right or wrong until it gets to the final product and it doesn't work. And you never want to be the guy or girl at in front of the company in front as the face of the company on site at this job or showing off your application, showing off uh, your new, your new website feature or showing off your new program. And then it doesn't work. And then you, and then you as a team leader are because they're not going to point at your subordinates. They're going to point at you as your team leader saying like, we gave this project to run. You didn't, you told us everything was fine. And now I presented it to the client and now the client says it's, it's wrong. And yeah. you have, and now you have to answer for it. And you say, well, I don't know. It's like, well, that just looks bad on you. Yeah. Like the, that's, that's why like, I, I told a bunch of like the young impressionable, like first year or second year engineers that like, if you want to do X, Y, Z, do whatever you want for like your undergrad, whatever like floats your boat. Because by the end of it all, all right, you need to have a team of everything. And so it just depends on which facet of it, which portion of that project yeah. do you want to be in, right? So for example, right, like if I mentioned that like, you know, mechanical and electrical are technically kind of different realms, right? And that one is more like a physical science, one's more like tech related. But um, originally, actually, when I first got into like engineering or like when I first heard of engineering more than anything, uh, I actually wanted to be an aerospace engineer and I wanted to build planes. Right. So then I asked a bunch of people, what kind of engineering do I need to get into if I want to, you know, work on planes? And I talked to some people, they said, you know, mechanical, you know, you need to know about your like fluid science or your, your fluid dynamics and like your, your, you know, sciences around that in order to make sure that you can like design the wing. Uh, I talked to other people that said, well, a lot of the control systems now are electrically designed. You know? So, you know, make sure you, you do your electrical engineering. Right. Other people are like, well, Software is actually what controls all the hardware, so you should do <laughs> software engineering. Yeah. So I'm like, wait, what, so, so what do I do, right? And so you just kind of like pick one, whichever facet of it that you enjoy, and hopefully, you know, as you go along, you, you continue along what you want to do, and you end up where you want to be. Yeah, I really don't think you, you have like, an, there's not, I don't think there's a, um, there's an aerospace engineer. I think there's an engineer in aerospace. Yeah, that's probably the better way to call it. I mean, yeah. I'm sure there's like a degree somewhere that says you're an aerospace engineer or whatever. But like, I mean, it's that that'd be more like your your um, specific like exactly. Niche like, ones. I know a chemical engineer who's doing nuclear, right? Like, it's it's crazy the amount of <laughs> way, uh, process stuff that needs to be required for nuclear stuff, right? Especially in um different areas. So, yeah, I don't know. Like, I, with in terms of engineering school, you just go with whatever you want, and then you just happen if you like something, you're probably going to be a engineering there's gonna be multiple engineering fields that you're probably gonna be competent in and you're gonna to wanna to, and you can pursue that one career path i didn't choose wastewater but i do know that chemical they have a whole wastewater stream um for electrical for you i don't know what your what your eventual field will be i think you're right now in like ai stuff yeah yeah so i guess, I guess like electrical engineers <clears throat> they kind of uh get cast into like a couple of like different areas i guess for like electrical engineers so a big thing that people think of when they think of like electrical engineering is like circuit board. You know, how, how do you put together a circuit board or uh, power transmission and like power lines and like, you know, power generation or, or like it's talked about less is like the, the signal processing and how, how we send uh, electronic signals back and forth. Right. So those are like three broad categories that you generally get like shoved into when you're in electrical engineering. Uh, there's like a. I mean, you can argue back and forth whether computer engineering is like a subset of electrical engineering or not, but uh, that's kind of like the hidden fourth field that like I'm more in at this point, where you 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 deal with more computer sciencey like uh, you know more tech related things that are related to computer architecture and stuff like that, and, and more specifically for me, I'm I'm an AI researcher to some extent. How much you want to say I'm a good researcher is up to up to debate, but. <laughs> Mm -hmm. That's kind of like the field that I'm going into right now. Okay. So coming on that topic of what we want to go into, um, since you had maybe a little more, I don't know if you even had more flexibility than I did with uh, choosing your program for electrical. Like what made you want to choose that? Because you, I guess here's my question is that you came back, you went from a life science degree and were able to transfer over to engineering. And then after that, you went to electrical why like you know whereas and you had that first year of like gauging around and like you kind of like skipped over some stuff had to take some courses and other things whereas with me i just went from high school into engineering and i kind of already had a mindset of what i wanted to do uh so why do you why do you want to choose uh electricals to begin with 
Um, it's because I had that opportunity to, well, let's put it this way. I, I, I saw and heard, because, you know, you're like 18, 19, what do you really know? But uh, I saw and heard that, you know, tech was the next big thing. And yeah, I, I kind of got like sucked into it a little bit, but I didn't know which portion. <laughs> yeah, I'll just say that he was another tech sucker that just wants to go into Bitcoin and Dogecoin and loses oh, all his that money. That didn't exist <laughs> back then. Like, yeah, but that's God. what that's what started it, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the way it's basically, though, that like I, I heard that uh, actually there's a really long story to why I wanted to go into tech to begin with, but. Uh, basically, uh, electrical kind of seemed like the most uh, vanilla, I guess. You know, I can like put the toppings on later for like the tech field, right? And I, I didn't know actually at the time that like there was so much into like signal processing, transmission of electronic signals and stuff like that. Uh, or or I, I thought it was just, you know, circuit boards and like tech, general tech, you know, that's it. And so I'll add the sprinkles on later to my vanilla ice cream and, and I'll figure it out from there. But I did have the opportunity to continue some of like the medical sciences, life sciences stuff because of you know the, the double major program that I, I found myself in. Yeah, because you're in electrical and biomedical, right? Which is also a very common field for chemical as well to go from chemical into the biomedical field as well. It's just a just two different lanes, but going towards the same path. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So so that's kind of like the path that I took like towards it I, I i going back i don't know if like that was the best decision or not but i mean it's, it's brought me here now so it's okay i guess yeah. nice i mean i chose mine mainly because um i kind of touched on it a little bit i want to be a bomb guy <laughs> <laughs> well it was uh, um i had this like weird need of like i wanted you know that sort of nationalism sort of idea where i wanted to help people i wanted to do something for the public service right and it just and when I saw the whole chemical engineering, I'm like, okay, well, chemical engineers can be bomb guys, essentially, if I want to be that chemistry. But then I realized that, especially when I took, started taking chemical engineer, um, to give anyone an idea of what it is between, between that and chemistry, chemistry will go into the lab and actually develop the formula. The chemical engineer's job is to take that formula from a milliliter, or I guess a um, ounce scale for any Americans, to a mil- millions per liter, millions of liter, or a uh, thousands of gallon scale that it becomes industrial use, essentially. That's the idea. So we don't, and when I started realizing that, I'm like, oh, this is actually even more interesting than what I thought it was. And I really started like a lot of the, I really liked a lot of the process stuff involved in it. And I think even if I could go back and change anything, I probably wouldn't. I think maybe I might go into pure tech, but honestly, I've had situations in my workplace and even by my own time where I had to stand on code something and it's the most boring thing. To do, I really don't want to be a coding. Yeah, yeah, programming is not for everyone, and in fact, that's kind of like the, the long story that I wanted to like mention a little bit when it came to like you know my my relationship with like the tech field and the tech bubble. So I out of, out of high school, all right, um, I I didn't exactly again knew too much of like jobs or perspective things, but like I had someone pretty close to me that uh went into computer science and spent all of their time just ranting about coding math logic and just hating their life basically they they were going through like a different kind of depression than i was when i was like trying to like grind through the medical school like, or pre-med or whatever right and they they basically hated their life to the point where like they, they wanted to do anything else but for some reason they didn't change uh anyways that impacted me a lot um that honestly was a little bit of why I kind of veered away from engineering because like, let's be honest, if you don't get into an engineering program or you don't get into a program of your choice to begin with, there's always some way around it to like get back. You know, I could have maybe done another year of high school and then like applied again or whatever, right? But I didn't because I, I wanted to avoid tech. I just heard that this person complaining all the time, all the time. And I thought that might be me if I went to tech. So I didn't. And then lo and behold, in engineering, especially in a general first year, you need to learn how to program. In fact, at this point, I don't think there's any engineer out there that doesn't at least touch programming. Going back to the very first thing we talked about, accreditation, um, I think it's required by the province of Ontario, if not just any program in general, that if you want to become an accredited program, engineering program in the province of Ontario, you have to take some sort of coding course. Because I, I'll give you a little bit of story to this. Um, in our third, so you, people think, oh, chemical engineering, you just need to do chemistry. No, 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 it's math. And you still have to take a coding course. And that's where I also got kind of like, I kind of uh, realized that chemical engineering was better for me because there still was coding to begin with anyway. But um, the amount of people I saw when they took that coding course that just hated it and just said, I'm not a computer engineer, I'm not a software engineer, why am I doing this crap? It's like, 
guys, it, it comes back to the whole, the whole uh, conversation, the whole idea that if you're an engineer, you are, you are um, major in one aspect and you should be minor in a lot of different aspects. And just because you took one course in coding doesn't mean your whole life has to be around coding, but it just means that you have to understand that if when you go into the workplace and you talk to someone who's a coder and you, they say it takes you them this amount of hours and requires this type of thinking around doing this code, you can't just dismiss them at and say, no, no, it's, it's easy stuff. It's like, you know, you have to have a better understanding of it so you can relate to them more. Because that's the best way you get people to do, to help you out is that you relate to them saying, I understand where you're coming from. I understand the type of work that's going to be done. Let's compromise to figure out what best suits both of, both of us. Yeah, yeah. And like, honestly, like I was going down that path a little bit, you know, being influenced by others. And this, this is like the part where I'm like, this is how I fell in love with programming. So way back when, uh, all of us in high school, um, you know, we went our separate ways. You know, uh, I had a good friend. Uh, she, she went to a different school than me. And one of the things that we did a lot was uh, we told stories. Um, just just to kill time, just you know, get to know each other, whatever, right? And uh, because I was too busy dying in engineering school, uh, I I didn't really get a chance to like meet up with her anymore. And because she went to a different school, that made things hard to see them in person. And so the, this is where like you know I went like heck is for me. So we were learning how to program. I was you know sweating bullets, worried that I was gonna like hate my life because you know the people around me hated programming, and. Uh, I encountered a situation like, ah, I have a solution. So I started to learn how to program and I started programming this little like storytelling thing. I had this little program that would, you know, inter it's it sounds more complicated than it actually was, but it was basically something that, you know, asked how her day was and if she wanted the story. And then it would just, you know, print out this little story over time and just tell her stuff and so I, I poured my heart and soul trying to like figure out how to like program this thing with a bunch of different stories and stuff so that I could give it to her as a little gift so you know you know keep up you know and, and do do some stuff and that's that's what got me really into it the fact that I could do some I could build something that could uh be so meaningful to someone uh the, f the funny story is like that I never actually ended up giving it to her because it was never finished. So, <laughs> but that's, it was, it was like almost done, but it was pretty primitive. And then, you know, dying in engineering school. So then, yeah, but that, that's my story of how I fell in love with she that. She would have been wooing over you if you ever, if you did get her, you wouldn't be single right now because of that. The life that was never lived, the road that was never taken. <laughs> so this also segues into another one. So um, the one thing I also wanted to talk about was, yeah, I guess, what was probably your best moment in engineering school? Like, what was your favorite moment? And if you say capstone, then okay, we'll absolutely go, we'll go. not. Okay, good. <laughs> that was and a nightmare. So, to give everyone some more context, is that um, capstone, or what we call? I think um, I talked with someone who was really who was a lot older than me, who uh, went to engineering school years and years before, and he was calling it something else. And I said, no, no, it's now called this. It's, it's basically it's the same. Generally thing. referred to as your final year project. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think in here in Ontario, at least it's called usually like at least in, our, in the schools that uh, we went to, it was called the capstone. Whereas, um, yeah, the one's called final year projects. And fun fact for me, I think, I think, actually, I don't know if you had one either because of your degree. I had three different final year projects of different degrees did you I, I did not no i had my singular one that required me to uh, because i did the double major it required me to integrate both like a biomedical application with electronic and electrical engineering principles yeah so mine was three different ones because so in case you don't know my program since i took chemical and it was called management so i took a bunch of business courses as well it actually sorry burp again um it gave me the um option to do an extra i think it's called an mba whatever the business accreditation is at the end of the year i think it's called mba where uh, i can do it in an mba is something a little different but... sorry what am i what am i thinking of is it the i think what what do business people say so after you finish business school you can get the option to do a two-year thing to get a yeah so that's an mba and you can get it accelerated through your program i think it but... was uh, yeah. it's it's not something you can just immediately get. No, 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 no. Mine was like it usually takes two years, but because I took the management stuff, it, I did it. In, I can do. I could do it in one if I wanted to. So either way, I took a bunch of management courses. That's why I added a, a bunch of business courses. I added on one more year to my life uh, of my schooling. It's not really much of my life. It was pretty relaxed most of the time, anyway. 
it, it, and then, you know, you get into the same mindset where I'm now dealing with business people and, oh my God, trying to deal with business people versus an engineering people. It's just crazy. Um, so I had three different projects. So I had my chemical project, which was purely based on, okay, create a process for something. Then I had my business project, which was run a company, <laughs> like run it from where you have X units of A being sold to these different, to this demand, and then you have this amount of supply and this much is changing yet, forecasting yet, 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 right? Um, that was kind of okay, but the problem was that the program they used was terrible. And like, it was like, almost like you can game the system. Like you can actually look up videos on how to game, game that software. So it, was, it wasn't like I was managing companies, more like I was trying to beat a game. <laughs> Um, and then there was the actual fun one, which is called the engineering management uh, capstone. That one was good because that one, you actually worked with a lot of people who were in your same program and you actually did both sides of it. So what you did was you had to make a product, develop it, how you would sort of develop it. You didn't actually make it because it's usually just a theoretical concept. But then the question is, how do you market it? How do you sell it? How do you, uh, what type of price point do you put on something like this? And what sort of statistical, um, benchmarks did you use to get to that point? And how are you going to be relatively competitive in this sort of market that you're dealing with and that was the more interesting part because a lot of people feel like that where i think we talked about this off um off mic one time about how a lot of actually i don't don't know if it was with you maybe it was with someone else but the idea of restaurants is that so many people have an idea i think it was my sister because she was a uh she does a lot of food stuff um how restaurants you see a lot of restaurants come up and then just fail all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah, all the time. Yeah, it's because you have someone come in, like a chef, so we'll use a chef as an engineer in this case. <laughs> the chef comes in and makes some great food. You know, phenomenal. They put their heart and soul into it, and they love the way they make it. How do you sell that? Because <laughs> if what you made cost $200, is it comparable to the $200 food that's being sold right now? And if you are... Are you in an area where people will want to buy that two hundred dollars food? Like, uh, for a better example, we um, live around the area of Toronto, and down, and, you know, same thing with any of the major downtown cities like L.A., New York. Um, I want to say Montreal, Quebec City, and such. You get to some ridiculous high prices, but that's because people are accustomed to that. If I go three hundred kilometers north of here, no one's going to pay a two hundred dollars meal, right? Yeah, and I think that's the side that some chefs and some, in other case, engineers don't get that they'll have this re- revolutionary idea or this really cool prod product, and then just don't know how to handle the side, the business side of it. And that's what I learned as well in my university program. So I think, um, in terms of what I really liked from engineering school, my favorite one was probably, I want to say, a couple of those uh, final year projects. Like I think maybe like that, uh, either that final year project. Or maybe what I really enjoy my coding course as well. The one vivid memory of the project that I have done that was really fun, but it's not fun because, but not fun because of what I liked about it, but more about what it was referenced to. Is that my uh, professor made all his uh, coding references in terms of Dark Souls <laughs> and Zelda references? And that was the most fun part. I actually, I think that was the one time where I had the most fun writing a, writing an exam. Oh my god! And me and my friend walked out of the room, and we were like, "Was the answer negative four? He was like, "Yeah, I think I had negative four as well." We turned around to the prof, and he couldn't say it. But he was walking down the hallway and he just gave a, he just turned rack to us and gave a thumbs up. And we just had like the biggest high five ever <laughs> after that. It was really fun. Oh man. Uh, maybe it's like something about software, but like, honestly, my, my proudest moment is probably also just related to software and that's why I'm like transitioning into it, I guess. But uh, the, the thing is like, it, it means nothing in hindsight now. Like there's, it was such a useless project, but I learned so much and it was just fun. So let me tell you a story about big integer. So what is, what is big integer? <laughs> for those who don't know, um, your computer can only handle so many, like it can only hold so much memory at once, right? That's that 32, 64 byte, right? Yeah, it's, it's the bit size of your, your operating system, basically. Right. And so uh, theoretically, you know, what if you needed to deal with numbers bigger than that, right? Your computer can't represent it because it just doesn't have enough bits. You know, if, if you have a number that's just way too big, like a big integer, then you need to be able to handle it in a different way. And um, computers take time to process things. And so if you're not efficient and you have like a bajillion trillion numbers that you need to like crunch, you're going to be sitting there for a while. And so one of the projects, not projects, I guess, but one of the big assignments that we had was to write a library that would, um, well, implement big integers, right? So some way to make a small operating system 
handle large numbers, mostly for scientific computing and stuff. But, you know, in, in general, it was like an exercise in learning how to write more efficient code. And the thing is, right, uh, you would think you know how to multiply and divide numbers. But <laughs> once it comes down to, uh, you know, crunching these really, really big numbers where you have to handle digits individually over and over and then doing it in a way that is efficient, you realize you don't know how to multiply numbers. But a big portion of that is that there's actually like a, a few different like edge cases or like strange things that can happen. Like what happens if you have to carry a number? What happens if you have to carry a number that's too big? What happens when you accidentally divide by zero? You know, how do you handle all these things and how, how you can stop your program from crashing? And that was actually like a big problem for a lot of people trying to, you know, implement this. You know, I'm, I'm talking to this and maybe there's like a computer scientist out there that's going like, wow, you're really dumb. This was really easy. But, uh, you know, when you're, first learning it for the first time and trying to figure it out, it's tough. And the one thing that I did that like I had the foresight to do versus my classmates, I wrote a program that would check my program. So it would run all of these edge cases and stuff. And again, this is something that, you know, in hindsight, if you know, you know, you should have done that to begin with, but you know, everyone else didn't. But I did. And I actually put my name in that program. Cause you know, it's supposed to be a little document header and, and you know, organize your, your program. And I sent this around to like some other friends who were struggling. Right. Was this cheating? No, because it was just something to make sure that their code worked. Right. You weren't getting marked on this like test case. And it was something that I just came up with like off the cuff. Right. It it wasn't, you know, giving someone part of my assignment. That wasn't the, that wasn't the assignment. Right. And the funny thing is that it picked up steam. Like people really loved that program because it helped them work through their assignment and figure things out fairly quickly because you know that's how the software testing and stuff is supposed to work <laughs> you know you you have test cases for how things work and you know make sure things go along as they should uh so much so that it started spreading a lot and people started sending it to their friends and their friends and their friends and it actually went all the way back around to me someone else sent me my program back to myself <laughs> and i i opened it and i was like what someone else did this and it was my name in it. They didn't realize that oh. they were sending it back to the original creator. And that was like my most proud moment where I went like, I built something that actually worked. Jeez. That's like, um, yeah, it goes, yeah, it goes so far around that it just ends up to like, I, I was expecting you to say something like, um, I went all the way to like um, another university across the city. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it was just like, you're, then all of a sudden you get called into like a different dean's <laughs> office about it. Honestly, you wouldn't, right? But, I don't know. I'm, I'm sitting here trying to like defend academic dishonesty coming from a different school. Man, that would be honestly terrible. So it sounds a little ego, Calvin. A little egotistical. That, <laughs> that your proud, most proudest moment was the one that got you the most fame. <laughs> hey, hey no, no one even knew that it was me. Right? They literally thought that, oh, it's just some dude's program. Like, well, you said your name was in it, though, right? Yeah, but no, no one actually reads any document headers. That have, you've never actually opened up someone's software package and actually looked at a document header, well, listen, right? Maybe I, maybe I do that. Maybe that's different, right? Because honestly, the document headers, I have to look at it just to sometimes get people's contact info. <laughs> <laughs> I look at it a lot more. Um, so I don't know what time, what time are we looking at right now? Anyways. Um, Well, with that being said, I think we talked, maybe we'll do a part two for engineering school. I think we kind of covered a lot of it. Maybe we'll do a second part about the specifics of engineering school. I know I have a bunch of other things I want to talk about, but probably some other people want to talk about, such as, um, you know, social dynamics about how in social some engineers are and how social oh, a lot man. of them are. It's, yeah, it's crazy. And then maybe a little bit about the program itself. But honestly, yeah, I think it's been good. Once again, we're going to, I'm going to ask you, but not telling you to like, comment, subscribe if you feel like it. If not, then then see you around.